and welcome to Mill Hill Synagogue's Hustings evening. I dare say a third Hustings in almost as many years. We could use a break. But we are, of course, in exciting times as countdown to Election Day in just over a few weeks' time, with so many burning issues on the agenda, not least Brexit, anti-Semitism, immigration, etc. Tonight is a great opportunity to get clarity from our contenders as to where their parties really stand. The first and necessary disclaimer, the last time we had a Hustings evening, I chose to wear a pig tie because we as a shoal have to remain utterly impartial. <laughs> Voting is everybody's individual personal right and choice. But reflecting on the fact that, for all the comments I got last time for the pig tie, I left out a tie altogether, so you'll accept it. I'd now like to begin by um, introducing our candidates on my immediate right. I have Matthew Offord of the Conservative Party. Matthew became involved with the Conservative Party whilst at university in Nottingham in the early 90s, working his way up to the voluntary side of the party until he became chairman of the Hendon Conservative Association in 2004. In addition to that, he's also worked as an agent for the party in numerous campaigns and seats. Matthew has been a councillor in Hendon since 2002. In addition to being deputy leader of Barnet Council, he was also cabinet member of the Environment and Transport, cabinet member for Investment and Learning, and cabinet member for community safety and community engagement. He won the seat of Hendon at the 2010 election, serving as MP until present day. Thank you, Matthew, for joining us this evening. <laughs> On my immediate left, my cats of the Labour Party. Mike has been active in the Labour Party in one way or another for 20 years, all in central London, which includes being chair of Cities of London and Westminster, where he stood for Labour in the 2001 general election. Then he moved to West Hampstead and has been involved in campaign politics since then. He chaired the Hampstead and Highgate CLP and then Hampstead and Kilburn CLP and contested council seats in 2002, 6, and 7. From 2010 to 14, he was a councillor in Kilburn and as a councillor, he was involved in numerous projects including saving a centre for dementia sufferers, campaigned successfully for more primary school places, etc. He's also involved in the Jewish labor movement and is a member of Unison London Region's Labor Link Committee. Thank you for coming along this evening. It's great to have you here. <laughs> to my far left, Carmen Lagarda of the Green Party. Carmen says she believes all human beings are equal. As a woman, a British citizen, an ethnic minority of Spanish Filipino heritage, and as a human resources consultant who has worked in over 30 countries, she has experienced firsthand how our society labels and segregates rather than unites. Human rights are central to her career. She has facilitated over 100 seminars worldwide, many on equality and diversity as a consultant. She's a chartered fellow of the Chartered Institute for Personnel and Development and currently consults at a firm offering immigration and employment law advice. She says, Hendon has a rich diversity of people. People need to know that the Green Party stands for all forms of justice and equality, and we are a viable political choice. Thank you for coming along to <laughs> To my far right is Alistair Hill of the Liberal Democrats. Alistair is a director of studies at a top London comprehensive secondary school where he is responsible for the pastoral and academic development of a diverse range of students. A tropical environmental scientist graduate from Aberdeen University, he has worked on drug target and disease marker research of malaria before entering teaching. Alistair has a record of defending public services in Hendon, leading the Save Barnet Libraries petition group in 2014 through 16, which successfully forced the conservative Barnet Council to back down from closure proposals. In 2016, Alistair was a leading campaigner in the EU Stronger In Remain group that secured a 62 Remain vote in Barnet. He's deeply committed to vast improvements in family life, including affordable childcare, and insists we are the party of the family. Welcome, Alistair. <laughs> and finally, over also onto my right is Sabria Warsami of the UKIP party. Sabria served for five years as a Liberal Democrat before making national headlines when crossing over and joining UKIP. Born in Somalia, he came to England in 2000, currently living in Hendon, 
and explains that he became dismayed with the Lib Dems' EU policies, insisting that UKIP is not a racist party, and adds, they've come up with good policies which work for everyone, jobs, education, pensions, and welfare. They look at the bigger picture of what's going on. It previously stood in council elections, and it is our pleasure that you have joined us here tonight. Thank you. So at this point, I'm going to ask you each to take no more than three minutes to put forth your message, essentially what you represent politically. At the end of your three minutes, you will hear a bell by the wonderful John Cap. You can give us a demonstration. <laughs> For those of you, some of you might know it, his face rings a bell. <laughs> When you hear that bell, you can finish your sentence, but that's it. And in the spirit of fairness, we drew lots earlier to determine the order in which you will present, and I'll invite you then, therefore, to speak in that order. So in the first instance, I would invite Sabri Awasami to please open up. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, uh, my name is Master Sabri Awasami. Uh, my name is Master Sabria Wasame. Uh, I live locally in Hendon, uh, called that boy. Previously, I stood as candidate, as a candidate in council elections. I was candidate for Labour in 2011 and 2014, but I switched to UKIP. Now I am UKIP candidate for upcoming general election for Hendon constituency. I'm the only candidate who will work to rebuild prosperity in Hendon. I am the only true candidate in Brexit for Hendon. UKIP is a Liberian Democratic Party that believes in putting uh, Britain first. To be a liber libertarian means to uphold liberty as a principle of objectives. UKIP is not controlled by unions, so we can help business and jobs grow. UKIP will listen to the local business concern as regular centuries open to all. UKIP, as MB, I would, in education, I would, all the youngsters in Hendon should have access to academics and vocational education. I will open grammar school in Hendon so that whatever your background, you can get on and lead the next generation of business in the barrel, a new vocational training college to give more young people start in trades and service. UK is a country before birth. Beautiful before birth. Beautiful uh, before politics. In housing, if I become an MB, I will build more council homes to the local people and halfway homes for veterans. And the council lead, uh, conservatives lead to buy property through state agent at undisclosed fees and selling to auction, losing up to 20% value against all the properties. Bro property wisdom. Allow local referendums to overturn large scale branding permission. I will do that. Campaign long-term tenants and inflation gap on rent increases. Thank you very much. I'm now going to hand over to uh, Mike Katz of the Labour Party. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here tonight. I'm really looking forward to the evening. Now, it might disappoint some people, but I've not come here tonight to have a bust up with Matthew Offwood or indeed any other candidate. And, you know, I'm not even going to try and convince you that your vote, your individual vote, could be the one that decides who walks into number 10. But I am here to convince you that it's really important that you think about who you want as your constituency MP, because that is most definitely at stake. And I want to convince you, most importantly of all, that I can be the best MP for the Jewish community in Hendon and the whole constituency. I know this because I think I know that I truly represent your views. Like you, like the majority of people in this constituency, like most Jewish people, I voted Remain. 
I don't want to see us crash out of the EU on a cliff-edge Brexit. I want to see us maintain a positive approach to the European Union, which, an approach which doesn't hurt business or diminish our hard-won rights. I want to fight for better public services and smaller class sizes, or relax funding for local libraries, schools, the NHS and police. <coughs> I want to work for a fair managed migration system, not vote down a law which welcomes unaccompanied child refugees. I want to fight for affordable housing to buy and rent, not intensive and unsustainable development in the borough, particularly around Mill Hill. And as a proud Jew, I will always, always stand up to anti-Semitism, wherever it occurs, as I've been doing in the Labour Party through the Jewish Labour Movement. And I will always, always fight for the Jewish community's interests on education, on security, and of course on Israel. I'm no patsy. I'm no yes man. As I hope I proved with the Labour Party in the past few uh, couple of years, I'm not afraid to call out wrongdoing when I see it. Whoever is in power, if I think something harms the interests of the Jewish community, indeed any community in the Hendon constituency, I won't say you just vote along with it. Now I can't pretend it's been an easy decision to fight this election here in Hendon, and it was entirely and only my decision to stand. And I've come up for a lot of criticism from various quarters, but I couldn't look my daughters in the eye if I ducked the opportunity to stand up for my values amongst my community and try to reset the once proud relationship between it and the Labour Party. And I want you to think of what true and loyal friends of the community, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown were, and think about the hard work that Andrew Dismore did when he was a Labour MP mm -hmm. to, uh, to deliver new laws on Holocaust education, restitution and divorce. I share their Labour values. I'll finish by saying, you know, politics is actually a lot like football, I think. I'm Spurs, so I'm doing OK. Managers come and go, but you support your team and its essential values. I think for most people in the room, we share those values, and that's why I want you to vote for me. And that's why it would be such an honour for me to represent you as your Member of Parliament. Thank you. Now over to Matthew Alford, current MP in Hendon. I want to start by saying what happened on Monday was one of the worst experiences countries had for many years. And terrorism is a growing problem within our society. We know that there has been three significant terrorist incidents in the last year. First of all, my colleague Joe Cox was killed. Secondly, we had the Westminster attack. And thirdly, we've had the attack on Monday night. We should also remember that many attacks have been thwarted. A routine have been thwarted in the last four years. Actually, there's been five that have been thwarted since March of this year when the attack happened on the Houses of Parliament. When I was speaking to David Deleu yesterday, as I asked him, was there anything else the community needed to remain safe? And I told him I was coming along here tonight, and I told him that Marshall Hoffman would be looking after us. <laughs> he told me that Marshall would make sure that we're all in good hands. So again, I would like you all to give a round of applause to Marshall and the CST who are looking after us tonight. I also spoke with the borough commander. I also spoke with the local council, the leader of the council, Richard Cornelius, and the two local mosques to reassure them as well that they are more likely to receive attack as a result of what happened on Monday. But turning to this election, at the last general election, I set out in a manifesto what I wanted to achieve for this area, for this constituency. And two years on, I can say I've achieved a lot of that. I've prevented speakers of hate at Middlesex University. I have worked to protect Jewish graves on the Mount of Olives by establishing the British chapter of the Mount of Olives Protection Group. I have certainly worked to promote not only Holocaust Memorial Day, but also Jewish faith schools, such as Exide, that I'm very proud of, is one of the first free schools in Mill Hill. I've worked to improve the coroner's service to ensure that we have out of hours and in hours coroners available for people when they need it. And I have certainly continued to work with the police, the CST and others to keep us safe. I've been one of the leading voices in Parliament against the boycott, divestment uh, and sanctions campaign, something that people are just using as a thin veneer to criticise Israel. And of course, I have worked, again, not only on the peace process with my government, but I have worked for the opposition to the Palestinian state. In the last parliament, the Labour Party said 
that a future Labour government would recognise a Palestinian state as soon as possible. I said I would not, and we have not, and we will not. I stood at the anti-Al-Quds rally to defend Israel and to defend my constituents, and I will continue to do so. But it's simple. I will continue with my priorities for this area. I will continue to work on security. I will continue to work on education, the environment, and of course, step-free access at Mill Hill Broadway. <laughs> Carmen Lagarda, the Green Party. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? No. 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 About now. Better. Yes, better. <laughs> 15 seconds. <clears throat> right. Hello. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity for this hustings. Thank you all for being here tonight as well. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here. Um, my name is Carmen Lagarda. So from that, and as, uh, as Rabbi said, I'm half Spanish, half Filipino. And I believe all human beings are equal. And I think that's where all of us in the room today have the shared values, the shared sense of justice, the shared sense of community, all of us as human beings. And um, human rights have been central to my career. And because of that, I am standing for the Hendon constituency because Hendon enjoys a rich cultural diversity. I don't know if you know that 44% um, of us are of immigrant origin. So I'm standing because I want to reach out to all people from all walks of life. Now, um, actually, we used to live in uh, Bayswater in central London. I only moved to Hendon about three years ago. And uh, I really like Hendon. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful borough. It's a beautiful uh, constituency. And Hendon has beautiful parts, but you know, the Barnet Green Party has been monitoring air quality and our nitrogen dioxide levels are too toxic. They're actually above the legal limit. And this is outside our schools in Hendon. And um, I don't know if you know Brent Cross, but Brent Cross needs to double <laughs> the legal limit. What you can imagine is Brent Cross and there's Ikea. These are not plugs, by the way. Um, <laughs> And you know, we used to live in Bayswater, central London, and we moved to Hendon, and now my 24-year-old daughter, for the first time, has been prescribed an inhaler. That doesn't sound right. That can't be right. Why is that happening? So this is why I'm standing for the Green Party. Now, Hendon has beautiful houses. It's another gorgeous thing that we all share. But at a town hall meeting I recently went to, when somebody asked the question, how many have been burgled? to everybody in the room put up their hand. So there's something about crime, there's something about police, and there's something about us needing to work much better together with the police, so, and as much better as a community, to, to help solve these problems. The other day, an alarm went off down our street. My neighbor phoned up, knew that her neighbor was out of town, so she phoned the police. The police arrived quietly, and they arrested the two robbers in progress. That is community policing. That's the way we should be doing. So the Green Party is actually asking for increases to the police budgets. I'll finish there. <laughs> and last but not least, Alistair Hill of the Liberal Democrats. Um, thank you, and uh, good evening to everybody. Um, I would also like to uh, first express my heartfelt condolences to the victims and their loved ones of that truly horrific attack in Manchester on Monday. There are no words to describe the evil that is the murder of innocent lives, the murder of children expressing their freedoms through a celebration of their love of music. And the response of paramedics and hospital staff, police and security services, in addition to the outpouring of humanity and compassion from the Mancurian public, is a testament to how strong we are as a nation. Their actions this week are the embodiment of true British values that will never be silenced and never be shaken by the cowardice of terrorists. And we never will be shaken. And tonight, we privately meet in defiance of fear to discuss the issues that we face as a nation. And it is with great sincere respect to all the candidates on the panel tonight and to the great support of the synagogue, uh, Rabbi Shoket, and the CST outside that we are able to express the British values of democracy and send a message to those that wish to hurt us that we will never flinch. Now, I am a patriot. I am someone born into a military family and served as a teacher in state education, 
who holds in their hearts the true British values of tolerance, of charity, of compassion and democracy. But in recent times, these values have not been met in its entirety by the actions of the government. As a teacher, when I teach the values of tolerance, we have seen EU citizens used as bargaining chips. When I teach the values of charity, we have seen disability cuts and the closure of the door to parentless refugees. And when I teach the values of democracy and the rule of law, the government had to be dragged through the courts to allow the parliament to say on Brexit. But it doesn't have to be this way. The Lib Dems are the party that looks outwards and seeks to build connections with our neighbours to boost trade and bring prosperity, to tackle grave issues such as organised crime and climate change, and fundamentally strive for peace. My party's, sorry, my party's position on Brexit and the single market is one that puts out businesses on the strongest foot into trade and bring wealth to the country. But there's no point to prosperity in this country if it's unattainable to many simply because they were born in circumstances that deny them the opportunity to prosper. For true prosperity, we need not only the conditions to create wealth, but we need the generosity of spirit. And a generosity of spirit ensures that no schools suffer cutbacks that damage the life chances of our children. A generous spirit ensures people can look after their own health by proper funding of the NHS and social care so that their hard-earned wealth is not taken from them when they die. A generosity of spirit provides people with shelter and truly affordable housing so that they have security to start their own family. Now our great British values underpin my approach to all aspects of life, in teaching and in politics. It is why in every opportunity I proudly stand up and don my yellow rosette because I believe in a liberal democracy where people are free to prosper and where compassion and generosity ensures that nobody's future is denied by intolerance or by the circumstances of their birth. Thank you. Thank you all very much. At this point, I am going to pose a question in the first instance to each of you. You will have two minutes in which to respond, after which point again you will hear the bell, and then please finish your sentence. And then thereafter, we'll take questions that have been submitted from the audience or from the floor. First question to Mike Katz. Jeremy Corbyn is known for his strong anti-Israel bias, courts the company of IRA sympathizers, not to mention Middle East terrorists, and it is alleged by those closest to him that he has a problem with Jews. You are a proud Jew. Do you not see your support for the Labour Party as support for Jeremy Corbyn, do you not have a fundamental problem with this? Thank you for the question. And obviously it's a question that I've encountered many times over the election and indeed prior to the election. And to be quite clear about it, I have been stood up to anti-Semitism within the Labour Party along as vice chair of the Jewish Labour Movement, alongside Jeremy Newmark, chair of the Jewish Labour Movement, who's standing next door and finishing Golders Green, to people who want to perpetrate anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, to people who want to turn legitimate criticism of Israeli government policies, turn that into anti-Zionism, turn that into anti-Semitism. And it's very, very clear to me, it's very clear to me, that the fight that we have has not ended, but we have begun it and we are going to carry on with it. And nothing is going to stop me doing this. And let me tell you, if I was a Labour MP, and if Jeremy was a Labour MP, a, it would inconvenience those people that you refer to who are close to Jeremy Corbyn and say they have a problem with Jews. It would inconvenience them more than anybody else. And secondly, to be very clear about it, we would have a much stronger voice to speak out about, about those issues that you refer to. I'm very clear on the right of Israel to exist. I'm a proud Zionist as well as a proud Jew. I'm very clear that Hamas and Hezbollah are not our friends. I'm very clear that Corbyn was wrong when he said that. You don't have to look back in my time, Twitter timeline very far to understand that I did not support Jeremy Corbyn. The Labour Party is a broad political party. I know what values I stand for, and that's why, as I said in my opening remarks, you have to understand, you have to ask yourselves, what sort of values do you want from your own constituency MP? Do, they, do my values along with yours? I hope over the course of the evening I can convince you that they do, and that I will stand up to anybody who, who wants to support bigotry in, the, in a political party or in wide society whether it's the leader of the Labour Party and his cronies, or indeed anybody from any political party. So a quick comeback question. Is it your hope that if you were to be elected MP, you would change the leadership of your party? Yeah. 
<laughs> I've supported other people when I've had the option to, to vote for Jeremy Corbyn. If that opportunity comes along, comes along again, I'd do so again. <laughs> Next question to Sabia Warsami. Aaron Banks, a staunch donor to UKIP, <coughs> drew his support in candidacy last month, accusing the party of waging a war on Muslims. Proposals in the UKIP manifesto include passing a law against the wearing of a face covering in public areas, implementing an annual school-based medical check on girls from groups at high risk of suffering from the practice of female genital mutilation, and a moratorium on Islamic schools in Britain. You are, by your own attestation, a proud Muslim. How do you reconcile your religion with your chosen party? Uh, thank you very much, Rabbi. Uh, uh, I'm telling you one thing, that uh, UK uh, has been uh, exercised for some time uh, about the religion. So, and we have uh, no tolerance whatsoever if he uh, says so. so the metal mutilation case has been raised in the party, but still it is on the table and still has not been confirmed. So we have to wait and see the outcome of that. And most of the you know you keep you know members disagree on that, but still we have no official things that we have to follow for that, and, and I'm Muslim, so I'm proud of it, and I'm one of them uh, uh, as you keep. So in that circumstances, we have to wait and see the outcome of that. It is on the table, and we have to uh, make sure uh, when we release officially, then uh, that question will appear to come to me. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is to Carmen Lagarda. The Green Party has traditionally been supportive of BDS and has officially called Israel an apartheid state. Do you subscribe to those ideals? Uh, actually, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, actually, I don't believe sanctions work, so I, I don't agree with the, the main policy of sanctions anywhere. Unfortunately, um, when, we, when governments are looking to pressurize other governments, sanctions are the least violent form of pressure that other governments can find within their, within their means. And this is the justification that the Green Party used when they were promoting this idea of sanctions. But personally, I don't, I don't actually believe sanctions work. I believe that we have much more common ground, and um, I personally believe that um, there shouldn't be anti-Semitism because of what one gov one's government is doing. One should be allowed to be free to have one's faith, and one should be allowed to be free to love one's country without being persecuted for it. So I think there's a, it's so much more complicated, and I know that um, I'm not an expert by any means, but I personally did, don't believe um, in BDS at all. But is Israel an apartheid state, in your opinion? Is it an apartheid state? Um, I don't think I don't think so either. I, I think there's um, definitely conflicts and human suffering. Every, but everybody is suffering. There isn't one. I, I don't think there's um, there isn't one dominant force that's imposing incredible suffering over to the other. I think they're both. That both parties are equally causing suffering to, to both parties. And what we're trying to hope for is for um, a chance for both parties to um, sit down and have a mutual understanding and, and uh, recognize the independence of both states. Thank you. Alistair, back in 2014, former MP Jeremy Brown said of his, your own party, Every political party and every politician has to be able to answer the question. If you didn't exist, why would it be necessary to invent you? And then added, I'm not sure it would be necessary to invent an ill-defined moderating centrist party. 49 liberal Democrats lost their seats in 2015. 27 of them switched over to the conservatives. What's different this time around? 
Well, I think actually there's quite a lot of difference this time around. I mean, uh, it, it is a state, it is a comment that, that has been used, but we also use it ourselves. You know, we wouldn't still exist if there wasn't a need for us. And I think there's been never a more greater time than now for a need for a centrist middle party. You know, we see the Labour Party shifting left quite considerably under Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, we see a hardening on the right uh, with the Conservatives <coughs> and the UK, uh, together in many aspects. Um, so a centrist party is certainly needed for, for a sort of more moderate, reasonable Brexit. That's one of the biggest issues that we face today. But also um, other aspects uh, surrounding how we fund our public services and how we fund our public services without uh, strangling uh, our, our, our economy. So there's definitely a, a reason for us to exist, and I think we're seeing increasingly more people coming on our side from both of our main parties, um, as they see a, a sensible, moderate, uh, and, uh, and forward-looking alternative. Okay, thank you. And lastly, to Matthew. Now this question is going to be a little bit longer and a little bit unusual, and you'll understand and appreciate why when you hear it. It's actually based on an email that was sent to you on February 24th, 2000, 2017. And I'm going to read it, you'll understand why I'm reading it. Dear Matthew, I'm writing to seek your urgent assistance regarding the significant reduction that is due to come into effect in a few weeks as of the 6th of April as regards to financial support available to support the young children of a widowed parent. This is not means tested, but rather eligibility is based on the deceased person national insurance contributions. The current widowed parent's allowance provides a maximum benefit of £112 per week and the average payment is reportedly lower at £104 per week. The current benefit increases annually in line with inflation and is currently paid until the remaining spouse reaches state pension age or when the youngest child reaches age 20 or leaves full-time education, whichever comes first. For a widow with young children, this lifeline benefit could therefore be paid for up to 20 years to provide key financial support through a period of grief and family upheaval. The benefit is being scaled back in draconian fashion with effect from 6th April. There is a proposed new flat rate payment of £350 per month, payable for a fixed period of only 18 months. So in effect, the monthly payment falls from 490 to 350 a decline of 29%, and the benefit period is cut from 20 years to 18 months. And then adds, sadly, I can declare a personal interest in this matter. I am aged 51 years with two young children aged 14 and 10. And as I have terminal cancer, it is the case that they would receive some benefit under the widowed parent's allowance upon my death. Should I die on or before 5th of April, the current benefit would support my surviving wife and young children for 10 years until my youngest child reaches age 20. The total benefit would then be 58,526 pounds. Should I die just one day later, on or after the 6th of April, then the replacement benefit paid for 18 months would be a total of only 6,300 pounds. Therefore, in the case of my family, this is a massive cut of 52,226 pounds. We're not atypical, and the average family is set to lose tens of thousands over the course of the children's education. Heartbroken widows are clearly about to suffer from this dramatic cut in government support at the same time as dealing with the trauma of tragic personal loss. The Charity Childhood Bereavement Network estimates that 94% of widowed parents will be worse off under the new system. And the charity is reported as saying that young children who have suffered the devastating loss of mom or dad are the wrong target for the current government cuts. This is a cruel and savage cut to this vital state support and does not befit a conservative party or government. Mark Jaffe, the author of this letter, was well known to me was a member of this community and sadly died just a few weeks ago here in May. His widow is in the audience. Can you please give her a response? Well, let me first start by saying there's a huge amount of detail in that. I didn't, act, I didn't receive that email directly. It was copied into me. and It was actually sent to the Prime Minister and to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. But I'm very aware of the issue and I'm very aware of the cause. Welfare reform is always going to be difficult. There are always going to be losers because we have simply too much money being spent on our welfare bill. And a lot of the welfare that we're paying on things like uh, disability benefit, actually, is including people who, when it was originally introduced, it wasn't expected that that many people would claim the benefits that was envisaged. So our welfare bill has it in increased exponentially. Now, I have to say that this particular one, I do think it is very unfair. I am going to blame the former Chancellor, who now no longer is not an MP, uh, for bringing this in. 
he brought in a couple of measures which I was unhappy with. Many of you know I voted against his budget in 2012. I thought that was unfair. And there are other points that I've opposed the government on. But the one thing that we should try and consider is that having benefits over a long period of 18 years, for example, we don't take into consideration changes in that person's life. That person, it's very difficult to say to someone here, well, you might get remarried. But some people do get married. Some people do get remarried. And situations changes. So I think to have any benefit that's just for a child's childhood for 18 years is not always the most sensible approach. But there are other ways of children being support. Now, I, I do know about child bereavement. And so I do know what it's like. I haven't lost my own child, but I certainly know about child bereavement. And it is the most difficult time for anyone. But difficult decisions have to be made. And I'm afraid this is one of those which has been made. OK, thank you for that. But I, I need to follow up with one immediate question, if I may, uh, because I actually saw the emails myself. And the February 24th email was actually sent directly to you, asking if you kindly confirm your personal receipt and acknowledgment. And then again on March the 10th, dear Matthew, I'm concerned I haven't had any formal response to my important email that I sent you on 24th of February. Um, Mark actually made national headlines when he broadcast these concerns from his bed a day or so before he died. Many MPs have since responded, but the family are especially perturbed that you never, not once or twice, replied to his letter. Well, I can actually say that's not correct because uh, and some of my staff are here tonight and we were contacted by, I think it was the independent newspaper, to say exactly that. And we went through our emails and I understand, Hilary? There was an issue and there was a response sent. There was no response received at all. Well, you certainly... He died knowing his MP has completely ignored two emails. He was on the front page of the Guardian newspaper. He was on Victoria Derbyshire programme several times and on LBC. His own MP ignored the email twice. We certainly he never... feels very let down by his Conservative Party that he has always voted for. How can anybody vote for you if you don't take their serious concerns into account at all? In fact, you ignore them. I can certainly never ignore a single email ever. You ignored this one twice. Well, no, let, let, let we, can get in, we can get into this discussion and you can say that. We sent a response out. Okay, we'll leave it at that for now. We can come back to it in a little bit. I'd like to, at this point, refer to some questions from the actual audience. So, um, Stephen Wilson, if you would please share with us your question. You just stand up as you do so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not, not sure how much of the outgoing MP I've seen since he was elected, but that could, of course, be down to me. So I'd like to hear what the candidates would really do as a local MP for the Hendon constituency if you're elected on June the 8th. We'll uh, begin very quickly. Hi, well, I've, I think I've mentioned uh, policing. I wasn't able to mention, I've mentioned the air pollution, of course, it's a big, big problem. Um, I wasn't able to talk about um, uh, well, what we're going to do is obviously try and, and try and tackle the terrible levels of pollution currently in Hendon. Um, we'll, uh, looking at me through. Anyway, also what we haven't mentioned, what I haven't been able to uh, discuss is education. And one of the big things that the Green Party want to do is to make sure that there's free education for all children up to and including university level. In, in, so as an MP, if I was working with Hendon, I'd make sure that we have better public transport, actually, because public transport is the route of getting clean, uh, we have to have ecologically sound public transport that takes us to our schools, our places of work, and our places of um, where we need to buy our goods and services, and our places of entertainment. And we need to have these um, secure, we need to feel safe, safe and secure. So I'll, I'll, I'll focus on those too. Thank you very much for the uh, question, Stephen. It's, really, it's a very important one. I mean, uh, Carl touched on one issue of policing. Um, 
From 2010 onwards, we've seen safer neighbourhoods teams that are ward-based policing community teams diminish from being nine strong mixture of sergeants and PCSOs to just one. Recently, the new mayor, Steve Khan, has introduced uh, another member of those teams. But it's clear to me that one of my key roles would be, fire, would be work, working very hard with local councils and indeed our local assembly member to make sure that those police teams are augmented because it simply isn't enough. Barnet is the most top of the tables when it comes to burglaries in the borough. Another issue for me is fight for fair funding for schools. Under plans that the, the last government had, which now seem to be in some sort of limbo, they will cap funding for schools in Hendon, which will mean £500 less per pupil which is, would mean 600 fewer teachers. Now, the Labour Party wants to reduce class sizes, not actually increase them by reducing the number of teachers. So that's something that's very, that's very key to me. I think, lastly, I would say that there is something about actual presence and having to make sure you've got a really strong presence. I was at the Mill Hill Residents Association AGM last week, and it was great to actually talk to people about their issues. You may not be able to affect planning developments because you're not a councillor, but you can understand their concerns and take on board their issues and actually try and respond to them and work with the council. Thank you. Andrew Moses. I'm going to come back to you for No, it's okay, sorry. Um, this question is towards Mr. Offord. Um, you reportedly voted in favour of Brexit during the referendum last year, and no doubt you uh, voted this way, believing that the alleged repatriation of UK sovereignty, and maybe you also believe the uh, straightforward like-for-like -like exchange that we were promised of £350 million weekly, UK contributions to the EU budget, which could instantly be flipped towards the uh, National Health Service, as, as most other pro Brexiteers believed. Um, and you believed, obviously, that this outweighed the potential loss of research funds, possible reduced earnings from the City of London, responsible for one of the largest parts of the UK tax take, as well as job losses um, throughout the country and a significant economic downturn. However, a majority of your constituents voted in favour of remaining in the EU by a greater majority than the 5248 nationally. So I just wonder whether you might say sorry um, if the economic downturn does materialise and that you might recognise that notwithstanding that there is many flaws within the EU, it may have been better to have stayed to try to reform from within than to have the satisfaction of sovereignty from without and economic downturn. Thank you for this question, because um, I'm, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to answer it. Because I'd asked the gentleman where he saw me standing next to this Brexit bus. I never campaigned for the uh, Brexit vote. I never delivered any leaflets. I never spoke for anything. What I did campaign for was to have a referendum, and I made it very clear that I personally would be voting to leave. Now, my vote was as powerful <coughs> as yours, as it was as powerful as anyone else in this room. So to say this is all your fault is incorrect. But secondly, you say that 62% of people locally voted for Brexit. That's incorrect as well. Across Barnet, 62% of people voted for Brexit. Here in the Hemming constituency, it is believed that about 50% of people, 50% of people in, excuse me, in Graham Park, Watling Avenue, and other areas such as West Hendon did not support the uh, EU. And I certainly know that for having knocked on so many doors and people are telling me that. You also mentioned the economy. Well, the economy is currently flourishing with more than 3 million people in work. Oh, hey, whoa, whoa. No heckling, please. Okay, hold it, hold the thought. I'm going to come back to the earlier point that Stephen Wilson has raised, thank you for your answer, um, to ask the three of you, starting with Alistair first, about what you would do as a local MP for the Hendon constituency were you to be elected. Uh, thank you for that question, uh, Stephen. Um, first of all, what's really important is that you do need to be present and available as a representative for the area. So I would make sure that I'll be uh, having roaming surgeries across the uh, constituency uh, to maximise my uh, contact with 
uh, the residents of Hendon. Uh, but some of our key policies that will have a direct effect on Hendon include uh, the reversal of the uh, three billion pound uh, school cuts that will come into play thanks to the Tories uh, by 2020. We will make sure that we will bring funding back into schools so that there is an actual increase in per people funding. That will, um, that will ensure we have about 26 million pounds for uh, Hendon schools. Um, I will also uh, make sure that uh, we will take Thameslink back into uh, public hands. Thameslink has had a disaster. <laughs> Um, as, a, as, a, as a suburban uh, rail service, a high frequent service, it needs to come into public hands and therefore in our plans local government will have a say and we'll definitely be able to bring in step free access. If I could just bring up the, the Brexit question very, very briefly, uh, if for in one second, it was 58% vote roughly to remain in Hendon, it's quite significant. It was okay, we'll, we'll come back to that one in a moment because there's another follow on question. Let's just finish with this, go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you very much for that question. It is very important for new keepers, really. Uh, first, we have to cut the immigration. Theresa May uh, did cut immigration to tens of, she said, we will take tens of thousands, but she increases it to the highest level ever. UK wants to control immigration properly down to a s sustainable level. Save your Britain, energies before aid, protect the British culture. Modernize Britain, no tax on minimum wage, housing priority for local people, scrap HS2, which is we could spend some of that 80 billion in our crumbling infrastructure, such as roads, footpaths, schools, and hospitals. We would upgrade our existing rail lines to benefit our long suffering community. Unlimited immigration, we are against it. The EU free movement of labor means low wages, pressure on healthy housing, benefit, and less school places and jobs for our children. Okay, thank you. Just the point that we were discussing earlier, what would you do as a local MP? For uh, so the, I, uh, I, I don't know. I know. I'm asking that. Yeah. Well, well, first of all, I think the £350 million pounds should be put to the gentleman on my right rather than to myself. But uh, in regards to the issues that I've, I've already mentioned, Security is a, a vital, important issue. Um, I have a conversation regularly with the borough commander about what he's doing to reduce burglary, for example. And Barnet Council have introduced the ANPR cameras, which has helped a great deal. But we are surrounded by strategic roads. We are surrounded by roads where people are able to come in to burgle and to get away very quickly. So the ANPR works. The education funding, I keep hearing this, these cuts. There's been no cuts. And if, if people have actually look at the things I've done, I've met with the Education Secretary, I've asked for transitional funding to bring our budgets to a level that are neutral. And local head teachers have supported that as well. And now we have secured an extra billion pounds if the Conservative government are elected until 2020. Environmental issues, particularly I'm concerned about, are air quality. No one seems to be talking about that. We've had a brief cursory mention about it tonight. But I want to ensure that when we scrap decent cars, that we don't have punitive taxes against everyone who bought the car in the belief that just a few years ago we were told to buy diesel cars. So I think that's very important. Um, and also for me, business rates are a huge issue that we have to look after. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, get a little stuck in on this Brexit issue. I have another question here put by John Clough, who is our bell ringer tonight. And uh, the question is as follows. In his figure, 62% of Hendon voted in favour of remaining in the EU and generally accepts the decision of the country. Now, if we can get some clarity, because there seems to be some bantering here as to what the figures really are, and then as a follow-up to that, what will you do to understand your constituents' views on any deal ahead of any vote, and will you vote against your party or deal if the views are not represented by either? We'll start with that. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so in terms of figures, yeah, 62% is, is for Barnet Wise, uh, but that translates into about 58% uh, for Hendon, uh, well, slightly more for, for the other constituencies. Um, look, with Brexit, um, we need to put the, the, the final decision to the people. We've had the votes, the people have marginally voted to leave, but we need to ratify that by the people, and that's why we are the only party that are clear that we would make sure that we would give you the, uh, the opportunity to have your say, because it is your future, not just the future of the executive in this country, it's everybody's future. Now, um, Offit says that you know, he didn't support a hard Brexit that wasn't him on the bus, but I have to ask him, does he support David Davis's position uh, that off, uh, if there's no deal, then we'll just go straight out, uh, no going out is better than any deal? If that is the case, Matthew, 
then, then you do support the hard Brexit that, uh, that was going to severely damage this country. Okay? So our position here as the Liberal Democrats is to make sure that we get the best possible deal to ensure that we have um, continued trade on the levels that we have at the moment by staying in the single market. And that is what we position our have, and I think this is best reflects the position of Hendon. Carmen? Well, as you know, the Green Party is actually asking for clarity on this Brexit deal that nobody seems to know anything about, and yet we're supposed to just go ahead with it and, and trust Theresa May and, the, and her government. So what the Green Party is, is saying, yes, we acknowledge that the majority of the population, we're a democracy, we have to accept that Brexit is, you know, is going to happen, but what is the deal on the table so the Green Party is saying, let's have a referendum once we know what the Brexit deal is, so that people who voted Brexit can see, is this the Brexit that they wanted? Because nobody, you know, there's been no consultation at all by the government to the people of Britain. So how do we know what the Brexit is going to look like if we're not consulted? And this is what the Green Party is saying. We have to see what the deal is. We have to know what we're getting into. And that's why the Green Party is saying, let's have a referendum on the final Brexit deal with an option to stay in the EU if we're not happy with it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to now hand over to Mike Tats. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. So firstly on the figures, there's some sort of consensus emerging. The trouble is the, the vote was counted. This isn't a particular uh, Barnet issue, but the vote was counted at local authority level. And then we went counting the votes, took a, uh, took a judgment as to what each what level each ward was, and, and we think it's around about the 60% mark, a little higher than 58%, but I'll settle for that in a, in, in a crush. I'd, I'd, I'd certainly have to echo Alistair's uh, kind of question about what a, hard, you know, what a hard Brexit means and whether that means actually does crashing out if we don't actually get a deal. My own position is that the Labour Party set out some very clear tests a key, part of, a key one of those tests is, does it deliver exactly the same benefits, to use David Davis's words, a shadow, sorry, the Brexit secretary, as we currently have as members of the Single Market and Customs Union? Does it protect the rights and protections we've got from the EU? Does it make sure that we maintain the relationships like we have with other European agencies, like Europol? Um, does it uh, make, make sure that it ensures the fair management of migration? If those tests aren't met, if it's clear public opinion is changing on this and is not sure, we should have a second referendum. And I make this pledge to you tonight, as I've pledged throughout the constituency. If we don't get a second referendum, I will hold one in Hendon and be informed and base my, my vote in the House of Commons on what the people of Hendon tell me. Because I know from talking to the majority of people in Hendon that they are worried by a hard Brexit and they would want me to reject one. Thank you. Go ahead, Matthew. I've asked the rabbi for a couple of backs in a second because and there are too many points for me to answer. First of all, no one's explained what a hard Brexit is. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as a hard divorce or a soft divorce. You're either divorced or you're not. And it comes down to if you're in a customs union, you cannot make trade deals with the rest of the world. If you remain in the single market, you have no control over immigration, goods, services, people, trade. If we remained in that, the EU would say, well, you're still a member. So you voted to leave, so leave. So this is complete anathema. And it's been already established by the Conservative Party in the white paper, and I'm not gonna bore everyone once again with the 12 objectives, because you can read them online, of what it will actually mean. And uh, I won't go back to the figures because people are just extrapolating what they believe is correct. But only today, the chairman of the Lloyds Banking Group in London said that the city could deal with no deal. It is a complete anathema to keep saying that we will suddenly crash out. But most of all, let's, let's just tackle one point. Having a, a referendum in Hendon changes nothing. This was a national referendum on a national basis, and the people decided. The people decided for us to leave. I and others voted to, in the Labour Party voted to trigger Article 50. To not have done so would have undermined democracy, and people would not have accepted that. That would have been undemocratic. Now, in 2008, the Liberal Democrats were clamouring for a, a referendum. And suddenly now, they didn't want one this time. But they want another one. And why is that? Because they want this decision to change. Well, in, I know, and we're not talking about in Hendon or wherever, <coughs> that however many people voted for Brexit, 52 across the country, 52%, 
the majority of people in this country, over two thirds now say, just get on with it. Okay, Sabrioka. A British, you, a British people spoke about, and they said, oh, we are Brexit, and we have voted Brexit. Uh, because if you had soft bricks, Brexit means it's fake Brexit. I will I will give you a definition. If you had you know hard Brexit means we have to go ahead and deal with the issue. That's what it means. Our country is back. Our jobs will be back. Our generation, our children and grandchildren uh, hope will be back. Uh, whatever a uh, handle voted for a uh, Brexit, doesn't matter. It's a national. So as Ukiba is the only option, is the only party that can deliver all these things. We are the creators of Brexit and referendum and we will continue to do so and to uh, enhance all the British people in a very good way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, because this is a particularly sensitive subject, if there's any 60 second and literally 60 second retort that anybody here wants to throw out, please by all means do so. Go ahead. Very quickly, I think from what, I, what I want is a mature debate about this. And actually, I think this is a hugely important decision. To pick up very quickly on two points, it would, uh, a referendum in Hendon, if I were to run one as the MP, would affect something. It would change, it would change the way that I voted. I'd make sure I voted in line with what local people told me they wanted for a start. Secondly, do we believe for a moment, had the referendum been resolved, that all those who were advocating Brexit from UKIP and Aaron Banks out, do we believe that they would meekly sleek into their homes and say, never utter a word for a generation? Of course not. They would want to carry on pushing. And I think it's absolutely fair enough that those who have concerns about Brexit, those who wanted to remain, rightly and democratically say, we aren't sure about this. Can we have a think about this? Can we look at this deal again? Uh, can I just say also that, Matthew, not only have you voted against UK membership of the EU 12 times between 2016 and 2017, you've also voted against the right for EU nationals already living in the UK. You, you voted against them having a right to remain. And you've voted that 11 times between 2016 and 2017. And that's an issue I think everybody in this room needs to know. Alistair? Thank you. I mean, the, the words from Matthew Offords are quite clear. Lloyds could survive. Well, I think I need a lot more certainty than could when we're talking about the biggest industry in this country. And the biggest problem with the direction we're traveling at the moment is that there is no consensus. And we're heading into a, a sort of period of time now where we haven't got people on all sides to consider our future, which is why we need to set up a second referendum. Not a second referendum, actually, but a referendum for ratification, that we agree that we are going to leave because nobody voted on how we should leave. Uh, and we only voted to leave. And you know, we respect that, and we are going to go into negotiations uh, looking for the best possible deal that will bring the best possible uh, results for our business and for our EU nationals. And the way things are going right now is simply not going in that direction. So we are. Uh, thank you very much again. We can't afford to pay 55 million a day membership fee. Can we afford? It's no. So we will go ahead without Brexit, and our, our, our country will be back, our jobs will be back. Our, so what I will do as a UK, but uh, uh, Labour Miss Conservatives <coughs> as well, I will put all the communities together to come together, reconciliation, what do we call it, to see each other, for, to talk each other. It happened, to, happened before here. Uh, Labour hasn't done, uh, Conservative hasn't done. I will do every six months to call all all the communities in Hendon to come together to share their values, to 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 talk together and and to you now to 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 come together very closely to integrate what I mean. So that's what I do, and that's why UK is the only alternative uh, party that can deliver. Thank you very much. And I need your vote. Okay, Matthew, you <laughs> get your your keep it to your 60 seconds. Go ahead. Okay, to keep it together. Uh, Alistair says you need another vote for ratification. Okay, let's say that vote goes against it. What do you do then? Go back to the EU and say we don't like the deal. Let's say it was tough luck. There, no deal. 
So that's just simply ridiculous. Secondly, um, it's been said that I voted against um, people's right to remain. I want to ensure that EU nationals uh, in this country remain. I equally want to make sure that British nationals overseas also remain. So I won't give that away. I did, not, I did not vote 12 times. I voted 12 times, no doubt, on having a referendum. And finally, my final point. What Mike doesn't realise, as an MP, you have to show leadership. You can't just go with what people shout loudest. And if we had a referendum on certain other issues, there would be a majority. I assure you, if we had a referendum on hanging, people would vote for that. But I certainly would. Okay, thank you. Uh, Adam Dawson, do you have a question about free schools?